Now let's begin this educational session. I'm so pleased to introduce you all to Greg Clark. Greg Clark served on the College's Council for 10 years. He's worked in the mental health and addictions field for over 35 years in various settings such as hospitals, community crisis teams, and Canadian mental health associations. He has worked at the Scarborough Academic Family Health Team for the last 11 years and started a nonprofit volunteer organization in 2019 to provide free emotional support online. He's a student of and instructor in traditional Japanese martial arts and has a strong interest in mindfulness and meditation. He studied at the Centre for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto and incorporates mindfulness in his work and daily life. Please join me in welcoming Greg. Thank you, Elise. So welcome, everyone. I hope this is uh, an informative and insightful presentation for you. So as with all good presentations, we usually start out with a quote from an expert. Um, and I think particularly useful for us. So having compassion starts and ends with having compassion for all those unwanted parts of ourselves. So meaning the ones we feel uncomfortable with that we tend to avoid. The healing comes from letting there be room for all this to happen. Room for grief, for relief, for misery, and for joy. <clears throat> so compassion fatigue has only really been around as an identified thing for a short period of time, relatively. Um, and a lot of it was identified early with nurses um, for obvious reasons in the type of work and care that they provide. And really, you know, it wasn't until 1995 that it was um, brought about to look at other types of caregivers uh, and people that supported people and had contact with some of the emotional trauma that they were going through. <clears throat> and one of the early ones was... Um, Figley, um, who developed a model to look at how this affects people and what some of the factors that are part of that. <clears throat> so for those of you who like the flowchart ideas, um, you know, the short form of this is really that the experiences that the person has, who they are as a person, how they look after themselves, really is going to affect the relationship with that empathy and compassion. And what we see when somebody's struggling with that and might be dealing with compassion fatigue is negative effects on their work and personal life. And there's other things going on in life as well, besides our work. So, um, or an aspect during COVID, certainly um, that I've uh, experienced and my colleagues have, is digital fatigue. Um, so we have other things that are adding on. So <clears throat> not only are we dealing with the emotions and difficulties of people and the things that they're going through, <clears throat> but now there's also the digital aspect. So, you know, connecting through, um, ironically, um, the internet and um, different forms of communication where we're not in the room with the person. So... What's been reported in some of the studies is that 37% of Canadians say that video calls leave them feeling drained. And I know a lot of my colleagues that do psychotherapy, for instance, <clears throat> spend all day in that format. Um, so they can't help but have some negative effects from that as well. And that overall 52% of Canadians feel physically and emotionally exhausted these days. So there's many factors that are happening. Not to mention the other things happening in the world. The world never stays stagnant in one place, and there's many issues going. <clears throat> so there's a few issues here that I've listed, and I think that this um, could be expanded on tenfold at this point. But some of these may look familiar, um, and certainly COVID-19 has affected overall everyone in the world to some extent, um, and has trickled down in different areas. So just to put the world in context right now, why compassion and compassion fatigue may be an issue. So, I have an ordinary water bottle here, and it's full. 
And if I take the lid off, let me just give it a little shake. The water's falling out. So my question to you is, why did the water hit the floor? Is it because I shook it? Well, you know, if we use that event as a bit of a metaphor, um, life's not easy. In fact, um, John Kabat-Zinn wrote a book called Full Catastrophe Living because he's suggesting that that's how we live all the time. <clears throat> so the real reason the water hit the floor is because the bottle's full. You take this bottle, It's manageable because even though there's still problems, issues, whatever that the water may represent in the bottle, because that's a part of normal life. We can manage it, we can handle it. You know, we're not denying it's there. It's part of who we are and what our experience is. But if the bottle's full, things spill out and may cause a mess. So there's be a lot of terms I'm going to throw around and the definition or to label something and one thing isn't necessarily that accurate because it's going to be how you relate to it as well. But for example, <clears throat> empathy and compassion are related, yet empathy is more that walk in somebody's shoes kind of idea. And compassion involves empathy, but also involves the desire to help and make their life better. And so compassion's more that um, thinking kind of mindset where we want to be able to fix it and we want to be able to look after that person. So who can, come, <clears throat> who can experience compassion fatigue? Pretty much anybody that is in a position of looking after somebody. They don't have to be in our professions. They can be somebody who has a family member, a friend, somebody they care about. And because we all have lives outside of our work, we're all those things as well. So this isn't just about our working life and that experience. So, um, we live in this world and the examples I gave earlier of all those things that are happening are also stressors that are part of what's what we're experiencing. So keeping in mind all the different layers that is happening here. <clears throat> so another term that would be used quite often is the concept of burnout and they're cousins. They're pretty similar in a lot of ways. And again, don't want to get hung up on this label fits this. This is not a diagnostic tool. But if you wanted to really get a sense of it, you know, one of the differences between compassion fatigue and burnout is it can come on suddenly. Now, part of that reason is people are doing the best that they can and not often reaching out for help or <clears throat> making their health a priority. So, it almost seems like a surprise, even though they may have had all these cues um, that have been there along, but they've been so much eye on the prize. I just got to keep going. I got to help. I got to do my stuff that they're not paying attention to the cues that are there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a sense of isolation sometimes, even though you may have people around you who care and are offering things, it just doesn't feel like that connection is there. Um, other things, you know, sleep issues, um, some people experience nightmares or just difficulty being able to get a good night's sleep. Uh, there may be overreaction to things or underreaction, a sense of numbness as well. And this is part of the, what I was talking about before. Your body tells you what's going on and we don't always pay attention. Sometimes we do the quicker fix because we're told you got to keep going, you got to produce, um, and that uh, that would be weakness. We can't have that. 
and a sense of apathy, like, okay, I'm going to do it. Why bother? Um, and often that negative thinking or lack of hope that pops in. It's like, this will never change. Um, and sometimes avoidant behaviors, you know, um, that can be anything from isolating from friends and family, the things that we enjoy to substance use, gambling, things like that as well. And it can start to filter in our uh, personal and intimate relationships, friends, family, our partner. <clears throat> and where it also gets very complicated is because then there's often a sense of denial. Nothing's wrong. It's okay. It's just a bad day. Um, and the person, again, will have those senses of isolation and stuff as well. So what you may see in your colleagues or even in your team, that whole system um, is people start to miss work. They start to come in late. <sighs> people have a hard time finishing projects or getting to deadlines. There may be some unprofessional outbursts where somebody expresses anger in um, the moment or in a loud personal manner. Um, conflicts with team members that weren't there before. Uh, difficulty following rules, like making exceptions because you don't want to say no to a client or have somebody wait. A lot of complaining. Um, and a sense of skepti skepticism about like, what's the purpose? Are we really doing something here or are we just showing up? Um, and a real hard sense to believe that there's something good that's gonna come from the future. So, something for you to reflect on. True or false, compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma are also seen within the profession and the literature as being inevitable side effect of the job. Do we have to have it? Do we have to experience it? So. That is for you to consider. Um, and maybe by the end, uh, I can help you get an answer for that that uh, is hopefully a positive one. <laughs> so, sliding into a little bit of where mindfulness comes, and I'm gonna make a good case for it, <clears throat> is that um, one study tells us that 47% of the time, people are thinking about something other than what they're doing. I actually think that's a pretty low number. <laughs> I think it's probably higher. Um, especially when we have our little hand computer all the time. Um, but this was done with a study that actually looked at 15,000 people and 650,000 experiences. So having read studies that have 12 people, this one gives me a little idea that uh, this number is at least fairly credible and not just because it's from Harvard. And why is compassion part of what we're talking about and why we care about it? So there's growing evidence that self-compassion is an important variable in stress and coping. It has also been found to promote a range of positive outcomes, including happiness, optimism, emotional intelligence, wisdom, and adaptive coping, which means you have a lot of choices on how you deal with things. So compassion is a big part. And some of the research is also talking about our emotional resilience and how that's connected with both burnout and compassion fatigue. So that resilience can be really important in order for us to cope with things and manage. Similar to the bottle that doesn't leak. So, you know, having our ability to practice that self-care, exercise, to feel replenished and get back some of that good feeling that we're missing. Um, being, being able to express ourselves in a meaningful way. Having that optimism and hope that we saw perhaps at the workplace when somebody's struggling, you not seen. So it's something that we really wanna to move towards. <clears throat> and then mindfulness. So, 
some of the evidence that um, we've seen, or I've seen, um, and this is in the counseling vein. So a mindful psychological counselor is likely to focus on the present moment with a clear mind and can be fully aware of what's happening in the session. So you can imagine when you're interacting with a client, if you're present and you're there and they feel that you're there and you care, and you're also noticing what's happening with them, isn't that a more positive experience than that half your mind is over here and over here and <clears throat> what you were doing with the last client, what do you gotta do next? I gotta drop my kid tonight, <sighs> or you're here. Okay. So that's one of the things that we want about mindfulness. It isn't just the practice, it's that state of being present. So I'm gonna have quite a few slides. Some of them I'm gonna breeze through because they are about um, studies and things that are proving my point, but um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on those. And as I mentioned before, and some of these I'll refer back to quite a few times, but resilience is important. Um, but for, so we both have the understa same understanding. Resilience is a dynamic process. So it's not passive, it's not apathy including positive adaption. There we go again, being able to do things um, even when things haven't been planned in a certain way. To, to adapt in a context of significant adversity. You know, plan A rarely works out. We can handle plan B, C, D, et cetera. And the ability to bounce back from stress or trauma because it's gonna happen. That full bottle is a common thing in life, and especially with all the factors we've talked about that we're living with. <clears throat> so this study I did find quite interesting. So, and so in China, and I don't know the exact location, but I can get it for you. Um, there was a hotline set up for COVID-19 to support people and have a place to call and they only identify people as counselors. And during a very stressful time too, right? Because this is right in the middle of COVID. And one of the things that they wanted to do was figure out how the staff were coping. And so they took two sides of it. And some of the staff were provided with mindfulness training and support and how to do a personal practice. And the others um, weren't, control group, right? So, and what was found was those who engaged in the mindfulness practice did much better. They were able to connect with people. Their um, self-awareness um, was increased and in that they were able to better service the clients. So I'm paraphrasing the study, but essentially in this study, and it was also nice to have one that wasn't a North American study done at Harvard. Um, we see this is the human application. It's not just a Western philosophy. And again, there's other articles that are speaking to the benefits. Um, so this concept, concept of trait or state mindfulness. So is really talking about is it when I sit down to practice? Is that my mindfulness? It's only when I do my 15 minutes in the morning or before bed and I get in the lotus position and do it. Or is it part of who I am? The characteristic, how I carry myself, how I see the world. So now one does help the other. If you have regular practice and it's something that becomes part of how you do things, then you can draw upon the useful parts of mindfulness in your day-to-day -day life as you're experiencing things and interacting with the world. Okay, so that's really what um, this study looked at is, you know, can we do both? And they're both useful. So, just to be clear with the idea of self-compassion, um, to give us a definition, 
it talks about three key aspects of it. So a mindful awareness of one's own pain and suffering. So this doesn't have to be in a dramatic part of pain and suffering. This can just be negative, difficult, challenging feelings and emotions. And treating oneself with care and concern during difficult times. Well, once again, when I did the earlier example of when somebody's experiencing compassion fatigue, they kind of fluff it off. They don't necessarily take responsibility for it or allow themselves um, to be a priority. And the capacity to re relate to one's suffering to the wider experience of the human experience. So that's, we're part of the world. You know, this isn't us individually and especially having to suffer. So it's really that awareness, that connection to it, and knowing that um, we have this level of self-compassion that we can connect with and really give ourselves a break in that sense. So then again, looking at the mindfulness connection to it. So John Kabat-Zinn um, looked at mindfulness and how it might be applied to um, Western mental health concepts. And in, we'll have the date later, but developed a program that we'll talk about in a little while that um, you know, may be beneficial to look at um, how this can help. But it was really looking at what the benefits were um, from a more scientific standpoint um, and how we can apply it to people. So, so that's why I'm using his definition. Um, mindfulness is often defined in terms of bringing one's complete attention to what is happening in the present moment in a non-judgmental way. So if you have a thought of anger, fear, frustration, it doesn't have to be that's a good one, that's a bad one, that's neutral. It just is. So mindfulness allows us to identify them without getting into any kind of struggle or judgment or having to change things. <clears throat> so this was an interesting study um, that was looking at self-compassion um, mindfulness. So the intent was to have the focus on self-compassion. And it was done um, training nurses um, in over an eight week period. And the emerging research suggests that self-compassion interventions may provide protective factors and enhance resilience. So the idea is if you have it as part of early intervention and training earlier in somebody's career when they're a student or first getting into the different helping fields, that it can be protective. Because all too often, we identify things when we're suffering from them or having difficulties with them and having to go backtrack and feel like we have to fix it. Where part of what we're talking about is, are there tools that we can put in place, such as mindfulness, to help us manage things from the beginning so that the impact of some of the negative things or the challenges um, or the problems that we're exposed to from others have a lesser impact and it's easier for us to manage those. So <sighs> this is just a, a graphic to give you a sense of, yeah, what what are some of the benefits of mindfulness? So if, if I'm promoting this as something that's gonna be helpful for people to see things in a different way um, and benefit from and not have the negative effects of um, compassion fatigue, um, why would we do that? One of the ones I like on here the most is restores childlike wonder. <clears throat> so one thing, um, that when you're around young children or puppies, um, you notice is 
they're experiencing the world in this moment and what is presented right in front of them. They're not thinking about what happened this morning. They're not necessarily thinking about tonight. It's the here and now. And instead of judging it, which adults tend to do, is this good, bad, right, wrong? Um, kids are just like, oh, this is what's happening. This is great. Um, I want to know more. I'm curious. Okay. So that, that one really stands out for me. That it's something that we tend to lose with all the responsibility and stuff in our lives. Um, and reduces stress. There's lots of studies that support that. Um, bolsters cognitive flexibility, which again is something we were talking about earlier, that resiliency is important. Um, may even help with some of our physical symptoms like lowering blood pressure, for instance. And heart rate and interfering with, um, you know, the stress hormones being released and um, having that blood pressure and heart rate up all the time, um, moving us towards the fight or flight, just in case. Because part of what happens when we have a lot of stress and anxiety and difficulty in our life is we're just that little bit prepared, getting ready, anticipating what the next problem is going to be. And if you're present and you're here, then that doesn't necessarily have to be the way that you approach the world, anticipating what's wrong, what the next problem is going to be. And because it seems like a fairly passive activity, um, it's often overlooked mindfulness as a way to deal with or promote resiliency. But what some of the studies are telling us is that's actually the opposite. So in the 2007 report, that psychology trainees who went through eight week mindfulness-based stress reduction course significantly increased their empathy. Show that practicing a mindfulness by mental health providers is a significant predictor of counseling, self-efficiency, and attention during therapy. Again, they're present. Their ability to be there with and for their clients. and more studies that are showing the good parts of it. So I'll move on from that one. Um, so, you know, part of when I was researching this was looking at study after study that was telling us that there is benefits and they come in various forms, right from the resiliency to having a good sense of who they are, increasing their self-compassion. And that this isn't a difficult journey or path, that these are available to us. Um, and what if we incorporated them into the education that we provide for our students or staff and institutions? And we'll talk a bit about that in a sec as well. And more studies. So this one, I, um, I always like this graphic and it's a reminder that pops into my head sometimes. So mindful of all the things going on, all the worries, all the difficulties, all the challenges, or mindful. Literally stopping and smelling the flowers. We're noticing they're there. So you even have the opportunity to make that decision that it's available to me. Oh, John snuck back in. We don't need him there. So <clears throat> one of the formal ones that I talked about again was mindfulness-based stress reduction. I have a slight bias because I am trained as a facilitator in this and I've done many courses um, with people. Um, but it's been shown to positively affect the way in which the brain processes difficult emotions under stress. Okay. 
shifting activation in particular areas of the prefrontal cortex from right-sided activation to left-sided activation in the direction of greater emotional balance. Once again, that balance concept in our lives and our thinking um, can be very beneficial. And the other thing that we've seen, especially in the mental health field, is that mindfulness has become a component of many different therapies. Um, MBSR was probably one of the leading ones, but certainly in acceptance and commitment therapy, it is a significant component um, that is done in pretty much every session. Um, and some of the groups that I lead, um, it's definitely one of the, the cornerstones of um, how ACT is presented. And mindful-based cognitive therapy is also something that um, is emerging more and more. Uh, DBT certainly has that mindfulness component to help the person with self-regulation. And in addiction work and in uh, eating disorder programs, more and more this is becoming kind of the gold standard um, skills that we really want the clients to develop and be able to take away as part of that personal um, emotional management. So one of the ways that mindfulness can be useful to us, and again, we looked at the, um, the challenges people that are experiencing compassion fatigue have is not being present. And so often we're in that part of the brain that is self-protection mode, that it's looking for the next thing that we need to protect ourselves from. And if through mindfulness practice, you're able to respond to situations as opposed to reacting, then you have access to that part of the brain where your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience, your judgment lies, instead of that part of the brain that's get me out of here, <laughs> protect me. Um, And the other part of that kind of older protecting brain is, you know, we have the flight and freeze. Um, but also recently I was doing some um, training in trauma therapy and learned of the concept of fawn. So while you're in that freeze state, often, especially a person who's experienced um, trauma, then becomes the people pleaser and they aren't looking to get their needs met. They wanna pacify the people that they see, um, maybe the aggressors or have power over them and fall into that role. Um, but if it's coming from that self-defense place, then they're not even considering other options. So if it's just that reaction, that pattern will continue. Where if it's, you're able to respond to it, what's happening, what are my resources, what are my options, then you generally have a much better outcome. And for people in our professions, when we're challenged with compassion fatigue or high levels of stress, again, whatever label that we're gonna use for it, um, we can fall in that pattern too, especially if we really wanna fix and help that if we're reacting to it and we're reacting to their emotions and challenges, are we really connecting with that part of us that is responding and thinking of the bigger picture? Or is it, I just want to fix this, <clears throat> you know, not have to deal with you, do my best in the short period and have you go away um, without really getting a full sense of what could have been a much more therapeutic response. Okay, so not to be dramatic, but it is both sides of the coin, right? So, and again, mindfulness has been shown to be really useful in that regard. Okay. So, and another way to look at it is, you know, there's 
the other idea that uh, we're thinking about other things 48% of the time, but in that, you know, a big portion of that is thinking about the past or thinking about the future and what may happen next, or is it gonna be like the past? Is the pattern gonna replicate? And we live about 10% of the time in the here and now. And if that middle number could increase and improve, then once again, you're living in a more genuine way, being able to experience what is present in here. So some of the practices in mindfulness that are pretty much open to anybody, um, simple breathing exercises, um, things like the body scan, going from the tip of your toes to the top of your head and methodically going through and experiencing what sensations are available within the body. Um, for those people who talk about, I just can't sit still, you know, that would just not work for me. I'm just a hyper person. Um, good news, you can do it through movement. Um, that's kind of what yoga is, <laughs> a big component of it, right? It can be walking, it can be stretching, it can just be moving in any sense. Um, in the introduction, I mentioned that I um, have a martial arts practice as well, and I teach martial arts, and that's a big part of it. Even though we're doing something um, that has kind of some rules and ways to do it, you're present when you're doing it. You know what your body's doing, where it's supposed to be, where your head's at, and that's when it is the best experience. So you can move and do mindfulness. You don't need to worry. Uh, sitting practice is that, you know, just literally sitting. Um, you can sit in a cushion, you can sit in a chair, you can sit in a rock if you want to, if it's comfortable, um, and just making space for it. Uh, guided imagery is when um, it can be a person, it could be a tape, then you're going through a certain exercise and being led by somebody else. Um, and very specific ones like mindfulness, self-compassion um, is also a branch of mindfulness um, where it not only in the practices I've done um, takes into account ourselves, but it also invites others, both that we know and care about in the world and also people that we don't know about and bringing them into that level of um, self-compassion and caring and loving kindness, very similar as well. So <clears throat> there's formal and informal practices. So, um, Formal is when you're going to a class, you're training with somebody, you're signing up for a retreat. Um, and the informal is being aware to be aware. <laughs> um, when I've um, taught some groups in mindfulness, you know, part of what we do is pick an everyday chore that you're gonna do this week and do it mindfully. It doesn't have to be an hour, two hour commitment. It can really just be parts of the day, you know, and it can also be really useful during transition times, I call them. So <clears throat> before you go into team meeting and, you know, there may be a little conflict happening, why not sit and experience some mindfulness at that time? And again, there's no wrong way to do it. You know, you can lie down, sit down, anything that you want to. Um, so one of uh, a common place to start, and there's lots of examples on this and guided on um, the web, is the three minute breathing space. And that's the commitment, three minutes. Um, and part of what you're looking at with this one is what's happening in your thoughts, in your body for the first minute, then moving to your breath and focusing on it and then expanding, expanding um, your focus to your whole body and what's around you. It can also be considered a grounding technique. So three minutes. 
so just for your own reflection, um, you know, given what we've talked about as far as um, compassion fatigue and, you know, are you seeing these things in your workplace? Um, and if you are, is there anything that can change? You know, one of the best things about mindfulness is it doesn't cost any money. It costs a little time, commitment, making space for it and having it available. And those in authority, the powers of the be actually saying, yes, this is a priority. It's good for you, it's good for us. Because we know those things about the absenteeism and the difficulty at work and focusing. So if we bring that into our workspace and make it okay and encourage looking after ourselves, even in that little way, then that can be a di big difference. So, you know, your employer doesn't have to make a big commitment, but you can talk to them about what if <clears throat> at lunch or on a Monday morning or as part of team meeting, we just sat and did a three minute breathing together. Okay? So these aren't difficult options and there's lots of resources out there. Which leads me to, <laughs> um, you can almost not go wrong. Like if somebody's charging a lot of money to do mindfulness training stuff, don't do it. <laughs> now, at the same time, there's people with really good qualifications spend a lot of time to do it, that their time is valuable. So balance that out. Um, but so I'll give a plug to the Center for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto, since that's where I've done a lot of training. Um, and one of the things I like about it is they have an app with about 15 different guided meditations that's free. Um, and if anybody wanted to look at greater training, it's a great resource. They'll talk to you, send you in the right direction. And these are some other um, options to look at. Um, I apologize, they're kind of Toronto-centric, um, <laughs> but they'll steer you in the right direction if you're not um, connected with Toronto. With things being so virtual now, I did a five-day silent retreat through the internet. <laughs> in a cabin and I was led by um, the teachers there so at least with technology even though we can have fatigue from it we can use it for good as well okay and also in the package these are just some books for people's consideration and uh, the slides will be available to people as well um, so it's informing yourself about what can be useful so again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's what makes sense to you. Um, some people have a daily dedicated practice um, and there's apps out there that can actually just help you remember um, and have a nice well-trained guided voice there to help you sleep, to take two minutes out for yourself, all kinds of different things. So it's really doing the research and finding out what makes sense for you. And it just so happens. <laughs> yep, we're good for questions. So I hope that was useful for people <laughs> and we'll try and answer any questions you had. Sorry, it's hard to fit in that amount of time, such a big subject. So, uh, as I noted at the beginning of the presentation, we'll now have a question period. Uh, a reminder, I know that some questions have already come in, but I'd ask that attendees submit their questions through the chat feature on the right-hand side of the ses session page in the virtual portal. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as time permits, and thank you for your understanding. If we don't have time to answer your question, uh, questions, um, and if we don't have time to address questions from all members. Uh, but we would also ask that you um, limit yourself to one question only. I will now um, get then to the, to the questions. So this concludes our educational session. No, and we are now in the question period. One moment here. So uh, Greg, the first question on resilience. Mm -hmm. I've experienced some pushback in discussions about finding resilience after difficult experiences. What are your thoughts on how to address situations where a person may view resilience as a denial of their trauma or stress? 
Ooh, okay. <clears throat> it's interesting that there would be that kind of pushback because it's really, to me, resilience is our ability to um, look at something sometimes from a different standpoint. So um, again, we're going to experience difficulties all through life. And the idea of resilience is that you can respond to those things without it taking the toll, I guess is part of it. You know, if it was a physical example, um, you don't do heavy weights every day of the week because you need to recover in order to be able to do the heavy weights when you're ready. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it at the same capacity um, as you were before. So the quality goes down if you don't have time for that self-care to develop that resilience. So. Thank you, Greg. We have another question. Uh, is there any research that indicates that organizations that prioritize clinical or peer supervision uh, supports mindfulness and reduces compassion fatigue? And, she, and this person says, and by supports, I mean an organization that promotes. That is a really good question, and I don't have a really good answer. Um, I think there was, uh, in some of the the research that I was doing, there was references to that, but not that clearly. Um, so, um, I hope there is, <laughs> that's my answer. I wish that I didn't cop out on that, but um, I, I think um, looking, yes, searching for that, because I, I, I'm hoping that somebody has taken that stand and has developed that. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, and, and just to note that there are some uh, several comments about appreciating your presentation and the really good information that you provided. Uh, another question, can meditation trigger past trauma when working with those who have PTSD? Uh, now that's an area that of course is a bit delicate, um, but part of um, the type of meditation that you're doing too, is because it isn't just going deep into exploring your subconscious um, and it isn't that you're not gonna not think about anything. Um, so part of it is being selective and having somebody who um, can guide or educate about the practices like the, the self-compassion, um, caring ones. Um, maybe that is gonna trigger things that are too emotionally, um, of depth where sometimes it's, um, you know, I'm really just want to give my body a break and get rid of the uh, um, stress hormones. The one area that I would um, suggest being cautious about is the body scan. And often what we talk about is somebody has trauma um, connected with a certain part of the body or they've uh, have medical issues or pain there that they need to be careful about. Um, how far they delve into that because it can be distracting or difficult. And it's not that you're ignoring the problem, it's just um, if you have a broken foot, you don't walk on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's that kindness to yourself. Um, so it's something that needs to be done with thought with trauma, um, but um, there are certain practitioners that um, really do actually work on that in a proactive manner. So um, thank you. There uh, are some comments about sharing your slides um, uh, beyond uh, Ahmed and before beyond members of the college, a member mentioning sharing the um, uh, slides with their son who is a family doctor. Uh, there is a question here about um, should daily meditation be part of self-care in the social work profession? I'm completely biased, so I'm gonna say, yeah, sure. <laughs> but at the same time, the nice thing about meditation is if you miss a day, it doesn't matter. I get busy. I've been meditating for like 15 years and I generally do it daily, but I don't do it every day. Um, Cause part of it, you also have the option, you know, that trait or state thing I was talking about is, it's part of how I approach the world now. So I don't always have to do the formal. Um, I find opportunities that just kind of come, so. Um, I really do it between sessions with clients 
and I find that helpful. And that's just like a minute breathing, kind of, I'm moving from you to you because <laughs> you deserve my attention. Um, and sometimes that can be through, again, just very simple practices, even drinking water, washing your face. Those are mindfulness practices if you're present. So. Great, and uh, a comment that really follows on what you just said, self-compassion is my way of seeing reality. Oops. Um, is my way of seeing reality of life experiences as it relate as I relate to them and respond to them wisely, kindly, with knowing. Thank you. Um, another comment. Thank you. Sorry, they pop down on me. Um, <laughs> thank you for answering my question. I know it's a complex thing and probably would take a little time and reflection to really understand each individual responding. Thanks for the presentation. I'm going to check out the additional resources in your slides. Um, another question. How do you help a man begin to use deep breathing? Is there a difference in applying mindfulness to males or females? Um, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I worked for a family health team that was not in Toronto. And often I would have clients that were my demographic. Um, who are sometimes resistant to certain types of jargon that, um, or that's how they see it. So not that you want to manipulate anybody, but it, it is accurate to say we're going to do some relaxation techniques as opposed to some mindfulness, because mm -hmm. it is true. And like I said, I don't want to um, be disingenuous with somebody, but sometimes knowing your audience, you know, and even, you know, one thing that I'll use sometimes is when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. When you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. So one of the simple breathing techniques is breathe in to four and breathe out to the count of eight. And, you know, for people who are resistant, just having that accurate information about, yeah, this is how you can lose some of that stress or the body scan and tensing and loosening. Um, Sometimes that kind of thing where it's very tactile and experiential um, with some males, um, they're more open to that. So, Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, there is a, a question and a comment. I'm missing one of my best tools, which is to co-regulate. My practice has gone online or by phone. Are there tools to help clients who are not in the space? Um, It's a bigger question. Maybe I can pass on resources to the college to go with my slides. Because, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, it's a more specific question. And off the top of my head, it wouldn't be useful. Mm -hmm. okay. um, a question, would you agree that meditation can equate to a person's repetition of thought? Yes, but doesn't have to. <laughs> Um, and that's where something like a guided meditation or one that um, visual imagery might be useful to kind of break some of those patterns. So sometimes the visual imagery would be we're going to take a walk in the woods down by the waterfall. So the person is doing breathing, they're sitting in the same posture as you would for a mindfulness practice, but you're listening to somebody guide you and they're talking about you know, walking along the uneven path and you can see the bumblebee near the yellow flower that you can smell the effervescence from. And then you see in the distance, there's a fawn. <laughs> so it's building that picture as well. So sometimes um, using those different types of tools um, to give them something else to focus on um, can be useful. Um, or how they might see it different. And I think things like MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, would be something that would um, more address that uh, direct type of issue. Thanks very much. And I think we have time for, for one more question here, just a comment that mindfulness is gender-free. Uh, and and uh, a final comment. Um, thank you for your presentation, Greg. I think it's a good reminder for all of us. I work in Nunavut and find bringing mindfulness there is very welcomed. Wonderful. So you extended beyond the space of the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Yeah. <laughs> 
So that concludes our educational session. I'd like to thank Greg for a, a very powerful, interesting and far reaching presentation. And I'm sure that like me, you found it uh, quite inspiring. On behalf of the college, I'd like to present Greg with a token of our appreciation. The college has made a donation to Feed the Need in Durham, an organization um, chosen by Greg. They work with member agencies and community partners to alleviate hunger by providing fresh, frozen and non-perishable food to the, those who need it most in the Durham community. So thank you, Greg. Thank you.